Today we have come to this TEDx Surat, and the theme is to build. I was asking myself, what to build? Is it only building some bridges? Bridges between what? Across Tapti River? Much more than that. Between the mother and the child for their choicest menu, between the doctor and the patient to understand the trust that they have between each other. So all these kind of builds are there, inbuilt in this today's theme. Now one of the main, in fact not one of the main, I think if you ask anybody, then what's the biggest challenge that humanity is facing today? In one word I can say, everybody would agree on this point, that it is the desire for improvement of the quality of life for the people in the developing world, which essentially depends on how much of energy is available to them, that is one side. The other side, protecting the environment and having a system to prevent the climate change. This is the biggest challenge. It's easy to say that, okay, you will produce more energy. If you produce more energy by the conventional means of burning fossil fuel, then the climate cannot be controlled. And that will have such a severe effect. It's not for the future. It's for the present generation that they will feel that is unbearable. So let me talk about that what we should do about this, about the building of this. So first, let us see what is our standing. Generally, we all feel that we are very much impoverished. Look at our standing in different areas, whether it's in food grain production, fruits and vegetables, pulses, in milk. Milk, we are number one. And maybe Gujarat is contributing a great deal for that. In everything, in steel, in cement, our position is pretty good worldwide. Problem is per capita. Look at our use of mobile and internet usage. We have 1.127 billion mobile connections. We have 34.87% population connected by internet, which means essentially we are second world ranking in both. Come to the electricity use. There we find that we are awfully poor. Our per capita electricity consumption is typically about 1,000, 1,075 kilowatt hour. That's a 1,000 kilowatt unit. And that is one third of the world average. It's not of the, of the uh, very rich countries. It's, I'm talking of the world average, which includes Africa, many places, which is completely dark even today. And if you take a picture, a satellite picture, it has changed. We have improved considerably from the position 99 to position 26 this year. It's a remarkable achievement. But we have to do something more. Let us look at the resources. Because a country, when we talk of build, again, build on what? You have to have a foundation. The foundation is the resource and our work, our intelligence, our innovation. So resources available, we have a huge land. We have a, about 44% of the global fresh water. More importantly, most importantly, is our population. 1.21 billion people. Almost one-fifth of the humanity. And we have... Over 60% of them are in their working age. That is called the demographic dividend. We have all that advantage for us. We have a 500 million cattle, not to forget about them. Minerals, we have fifth largest iron reserve. We have very high aluminum reserve. There are many other reserves that we have. But our conventional energy resources are rather poor. We have a, India's balance of trade, if you look at, in the year 1415, we had minus 138 billion US dollar. And how much was our import? Import was 156 billion US dollar for oil and coal alone. So imagine that this oil and coal we did not have to import, we would have had a positive balance of uh, trade. So this is the big advantage, the whole thing resting, our entire economy rests on how much we import for our energy. Now, do you have much of energy resources? Yes. Let us see. If we look at the fuel, uh, fossil fuel resources, oil, natural gas, and coal, these are the reserve. And what I'm indicating there is the ratio of per year consumption. And that ratio tells you that how many years this reserve will be lasting. It's going to last only 18 years for oil, 50 or 51 years for natural gas, and about 89 years for coal, provided the consumption rate remains constant, which is not. The consumption is going to change, and that would mean there will be much less time for that to be consumed of. 
Now, why do you talk of electricity, electricity all the time? Because electricity or per, per capita electricity consumption is a single parameter which has a direct influence on human development index. Just now you had a beautiful talk on, on the robotic surgery. You talk of anything on education, on healthcare. Finally, everything depends on whether you have the energy resources to feed it. And that is why the human development index, which combines all these factors, availability of food, availability of milk, drink, everything, water. Water also depends on how much energy you have. Otherwise, this water is limitless in the sea. But you have to desalinate it, which requires energy. You see that Indian position is just about 0.6 above, and most of the developed countries are over 0.9. What you have to do in this scale, this is the annual electricity consumption, which goes from, say, about, we are at 1,000 level. If we go to about 3,000 level, we'll come to the knee of the curve, which means that our human development index will be better than 0.8. So it requires three times more energy production. Don't you have any resources for that? Look at the sun. And particularly look at this, this map of India, where the darkest red color means the maximum of energy that is being received. And Gujarat being the luckiest place, where we have the highest incident of the, the solar energy. So it's a huge energy that is falling on, our, on, the, on the earth. You have to tap it. What's being done, you see, the potential is as much as one gigawatt means 1,000 megawatt. So I may have some places gigawatt, some places megawatt. For, just to explain to you, one gigawatt means, and the P corresponds to GWP, gigawatt peak. Because solar energy is something which is intermittent. If a cloud cover comes, then it becomes zero. So that's why you have to talk of the peak power. So we have a huge potential for that. And if we just take 3% of our wasteland, then also you get that much of energy, which can definitely meet all our resources. So we are working on the solar very significantly, and our achievement is quite strong. Look at that. This is the kind of renewable energy resources. And as I mentioned, even if you take 3% wasteland, we'll be having about 750. But you have clouds, you have nights, so it gets reduced by a factor of five to 150 gigawatt year of energy per year will be coming. And it will be coming as long as sun is alive, and as long as sun is alive, we are also alive, so for our entire lifetime. I mean, our whole civilization's lifetime. Now, solar technologies, there are two distinct, you, may, you must say that, oh, we have been progressing so well in solar. No, no doubt about that. Most of it is by this photovoltaic cells, which converts the solar light into electricity, a DC, which has to be converted into AC to fed to the grid. And at every stage, there are some big losses. But more importantly to that is the fact that there are other means of, of uh, getting solar energy to get you very high grade heat. There are many operations where you require not just uh, electricity, but you need a chemical operation, a metallurgical operation, where you need the heat at a very high temperature. One of the most important applications is if you want to produce hydrogen. But normally, we think of that, okay, these energies are for feeding to our electricity in the house. How am I going to run our car? Eventually, petroleum is going to be over, not far away in this present generation. Most of you will see in your own life that petroleum is not there. How will you run your cars? It will only run by hydrogen. But is hydrogen freely available? Source of hydrogen is freely available, that's water. So you have to break water. And for breaking water, you need a lot of energy. So that energy is provided, and solar energy can be very effective for doing that, provided you go for high temperature. And that is done in a process called solar thermal. I'm sorry to say that in the country, the effort on solar thermal is rather very meager, because it is attractive today to just to put a photovoltaic cell and get some electricity, and that is what is happening today. There also, the manufacturing capability within the country is awfully poor. Do you know how much of the money that you have to spend? Our target is very good. We are at the stage of going to 20 gigawatt, 20,000 megawatt very soon, 40,000 megawatt by 2020, and about 100,000 megawatt by 2022. So such a big expansion in the solar energy. But if you ask that how much of silicon we produce in the country, well, all this based on silicon. Do you know the number? Can I ask this question to this great audience? It's very easy to answer that. It is zero. So we have to depend entirely on import for our solar photovoltaic cells. 
So this is where the mismatch is. When you are talking about building, we have to build these things. The other big source is, okay, this is the example we have been doing in a small way. It's a very small rooftop solar uh, thermal setup facility, and based on that, a large facility, commercial facility, is coming up in Gujarat very soon. What are primary energy sources? See, primary energy sources and fossil fuel energy sources are different. Because primary energy sources will not get exhausted. <coughs> fossil fuel is something which will get exhausted. It is there under the earth, and as we take it out, gradually it will get exhausted. So in the primary, the first is we can consider wind and sun. This is primary energy source, it's not going to be exhausted. But it is distributed and intermittent. Wind doesn't blow all the, blow all the time, neither does the sun shine. If it comes to the concentrated and continuous source, that is the nuclear energy source. This is the Kaiga picture. In the greenery, you see that how beautifully it is placed, and the, the greenery is perfectly all right. And look at the numbers. If you want to put up a 10 gigawatt, that is 10,000 megawatt plant in one place, how much is the area that you require? You require 5,000 square kilometer for the case of wind. You require about 400 square meter, kilometer in case of sun. But you can get that same energy in a concentrated, continuous, absolutely reliable form is from an area as small as two square kilometers. Now imagine that requirement. You have the requirement of feeding electricity to the large number of villages that we have. We have to provide that energy to the field. You require distributed form of energy. You need to satisfy the energy need of a city like Surat. You want to produ produce energy for feeding an industry, energy intensive industry. You need concentrated energy, totally reliable, totally un uninterrupted. There's no question of break. And nuclear can do that. So these are complementary. Many a time, we find this kind of a debate. This debate is meaningless, one versus the other. No, we need both. We need an optimum mix of these. And that is what the energy planners are doing today. Look at the average capacity factor. Main difference between the capacity factor on wind, solar, which is in the range of 20 to 25%, whereas nuclear has demonstrated between 80 and 90 percent, is because that is continuous, this is not. Okay. So now I come to thorium. See, the question is that, are we so much impoverished in our energy resources? We don't have much of uranium. We do have. Today we have improved that quite a bit. Today I think the number comes to about 2,20,000 tons of uranium reserve that we have. But that's not enough for our future. But when you look at thorium, I'll do a simple back of the envelope calculation for you. You can see that. What happens? Next. We have a deposit about 800,000 ton, uh, tons of metal. Next. Then we have, if we take 60,000 megawatt thermal day per ton, it is 4 into 4.6 into 10 to the power 14 kilowatt hour per cycle. 10 times of that, because you can do recycling of that. No, I think, yes. So India's stabilized population is going to be about 1.7 billion. Most of the demographers have worked out that we'll be reaching somewhere around this number. And if I take this 3,000, we have sufficient energy for this thorium for over 900 years. If it is only fed by nuclear, and if we take 20% comes from nuclear, the rest comes from solar, wind, even some part of carbon or oil, then it will last for 4,500 years. It's not a small number. Your human history is of the 6,000 years. Human written history is only 6,000 years. So we have plenty of that. And then we can say that we are really rich. We are not impoverished. We are rich. And we can be eventually the sheikhs of tomorrow because of our thorium. And how thorium is distributed? You don't have to really mine it. It's not underground. If you go along the 75,000 kilometer of coastline of India, and mostly in the eastern and western coast, you will find the black sand. And this black sand contains monazite, which is thorium. And there are plenty of advantages of having of, have, of thorium based reactors. The immediate question that you will be asking me that, okay, you people have been talking about thorium. Homi Bhava talked about thorium 50 years back, or not more than 50 years back. His centenary was celebrated just about a few years back. So it's so, much, so many years back. But still, why you have not done it yet? Reason being, thorium as such 
is not a fuel. Thorium as such cannot be fissioned by neutron to get energy. Thorium needs to be converted. Thorium gets converted by nuclear reactions. It goes to nuclear chain, finally goes to uranium-233, and that is the fissile, and that is the fuel material. So thorium has to be converted like this. What is needed for that? You need to have neutrons, and these neutrons are not available from mines. Neutrons are not available from space. Neutrons have to be generated, and this generation is done inside a nuclear reactor. So what you need to do is that, have the first generation reactor of today, and that is going to produce neutron. This neutron converts uranium-238 to plutonium-239, or thorium-232 to uranium-233, and this becomes almost an inexhaustible source of energy for our future. So that is our building from our own resources. So what I'm trying to say here is that you have to understand a little bit on this issue of fuel cycle. Nuclear reactor, it comes with a fuel within, in which we have both fissile and fertile. Fissile material and fertile material. Fissile material gives energy. Fertile material gets converted into fissile. And you can see that the spent fuel, which is coming out of the reactor, is not a waste. It is actually potential for further energy. And it's a huge potential. So India has adopted the closed fuel cycle, which is shown in the bottom. And that advantage of getting the fertile to fissile is something which we are exploiting. Our fast reactor is ready for operation in, Kul in Kalpakam. Within a few months, it will become operational. And that is the first example to show you that, yes, we have converted uranium-238 to plutonium, which is going to burn in these reactors and produce more neutrons to get converted the thorium to uranium-233. We're on the right track all along. There's a second important question, which most of the people here would know. That is the issue of nuclear waste. You will say that, oh, all that we understand, but this nuclear waste has a lot of radioactivity. And this radioactivity is going to last for many, many years. And that is seen in this plot. You see, it's about 200,000 years this radioactivity is going to last, which is above the natural radioactivity of iron ore, uh, sorry, uranium ore. And that problem has been minimized to reduce considerably by minor actinide separation, by those plutonium, americium, fission product, if these are separated, curium, then we come back to 300 years. So this is one thing where India scores much better than the rest of the country or rest of the country the world because we have already done this in our plants and again, not far away from here in Tarapur. So coming to the thorium application, India has already designed reactors for use of thorium. This is the design. Again, this reactor has now been I mean, the site selection for this reactor has already been done. The government approval is existing, and it will come again in Tarapur. So you'll see that very close to your town of Surat, you'll be having these major developments, which is sort of uh, uh, are kind of showcasing the ability of Indian scientists and technologists in the world on this one, where we are completely self-sufficient. Let me come to the best basic point, paradigm shift. There's a big shift in the paradigm. What is the shift? Shift is that, so far we were, all these years of human civilization, we, are, we have been using energy from the fossil fuel. When we first saw the, the humanity, homo sapiens at that time, they're not humans at that stage, homo sapiens saw the forest fire. All other animals, what did they do? They fled from that place because of the fire. Homo sapiens just not fled. They also tried to understand what is this fire, where from it is coming, where from this energy is coming, and how to create fire. They discovered what is known as the fire stone. If you hit them each other, you click a small spark, and then you can create fire. You can control fire. And that is how we have been providing human civilization grew up over the last 6,000 years to provide that energy to build all that that you have done so far. It's about a story of about 6,000 years. Now, we have perhaps done little too much. Result is this second picture, which is here. The thermal power is generating so much of carbon dioxide that our existence itself is at stake. Because climate change or the environmental factor will finally kill all of us unless we control that. The 
solution is here, use of primary energy. Sun, wind, and nuclear, which can actually provide us enough of energy to sustain the growth, to, to actually have the dreams of the developing countries to improve their quality of life, at the same time, not to disturb the environment. Now I'll ask one simple question, again, since we are talking of building. The question is countries large. A country of our size, which is one-fifth of the humanity, will it always remain as a market? Why I'm asking this question? Today, we are talking of solar energy, but how much effort we are giving for production of solar, uh, uh, silicon? See, you, the number, the total three lakh crore of photovoltaic cells are to be imported. But the effort that we are, we are talking of building, but this building is something which we are lacking. We have the technology strength. We have the entrepreneurial strength. This country is famous for its entrepreneurial strength. Why are we missing in these? And if we can really take the thing on our stride and advance in each of these areas. Just now you heard about the, the robotic brain surgery. In the medical equipment building, the Indian score is rather poor, very poor. Even a digital X-ray machine is not being built in the country. We're importing practically everything of all your cell phones. Not a single one is with the Indian technology. So there is a demand for that. We have to build technology. We have to build on our own resources. Then only this country can one day be rich and one day is prosperous. And we can see the smiles in the faces of all our people. So that is what is the building requires. So build on indigenous resources and technologies. This is what is, but it's a painful step. It's not something which is easy. It's not a question of only some uh, financial manipulations to just get something from other countries. It is a tedious work, tedious work for generations. Fortunately, I have been in an organization where this has been going on over a few generations. So I have seen how this is done. It's never a pro uh, process that can be done by a single individual. Again, taking the example of the brain surgery by robotics. I just now, just about a month back, I saw a development where they're actually doing not on the human, but on the models, how exactly the robotic surgery can be done and build that equipment. So that is the spirit that we have to have. Many of you are young here who would have a bright future, but see it in that angle that India builds each of these with our own technology. And that will really bring us prosperity to this country. Thank you for your attention.